So the, this particular session, if you notice, it was called a Jedi level session. And it's becoming harder and harder for us to come up with what we consider Jedi material. Um, one of the reasons for that is our engineers are working harder and harder to make Jedi level capabilities available to everybody, right? Holding true to our mission to help people see and understand data. So some of you will agree, I imagine, that some of this will be Jedi, some of it will be way down on the Wookiee end of the difficulty scale. Um, but we'll mix it up a little bit. Now, if you've attended this conference in the past, like my friend Larry here, um, either last year, Las Vegas, the year before in Austin, first of all, thank you very much. Second of all, you may notice something a little bit different up here. So I did lose a pound, I appreciate y'all noticing. <laughs> I also lost my Ben. So I presented with a great guy named Ben Neville for the last couple of years. He's gone on to different pastures. So I had to go out and recruit a new Ben, and boy, did I ever score. So some of you may recognize this guy. It's Ben Jones. He's going to introduce himself here in a moment, but not before I do so myself. So in the, age of on, uh, or in the honor of age before beauty, as this uh, slide suggests here, my name is Kevin Taylor. I'm a sales consultant with Tableau Software. I've been in this role for about two and a half years now based out of Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, my Tableau journey, though, started long before this. So like most of you in the room today, I was a customer of Tableau's for five years at companies like Cisco and NetUp back home. And even before Tableau, this is all I had ever done. I just did it on lesser platforms. But BI, analytics, data, it's all I've underdone. I hope, hope it doesn't go away. It doesn't look like it's going away if we look at the data. So beyond that now, uh, if I could point your attention here, this is my beautiful family here. It's my beautiful wife, Catherine, my two twin four-year-old daughters, Casey and Kennedy. They don't look like twins, but I assure you they are. My two twin Aussie pups, Eva and Delilah. We are in a room full of analysts. Somebody here is keeping score on me right now. Not to worry if you'll take a look at my second bullet point there. I do have two male guppies at home. They're not pictured, uh, but that does bring that ratio to five to three, and I assure you I'm on the right side of that ratio. Now, one last thing about me, move my mouse there, one last thing about me that hopefully you don't know if you do, I'm a little bit concerned, is I'm a big fan of trilogies. When it comes to movies especially, for my movies, some of my favorites have some dud sequels, but when they come to the trilogies, almost always they're a hit for me. Whether we're talking about the, uh, the, the Godfather trilogy or uh, Back to the Future, Ben's going to di deep dive into the Back to the Future here for you. Pretty interesting. Or of course, probably you've heard of Star Wars, right? Anybody? Trilogy of trilogies. And then, of course, Beyond Bars and Lines, the third edition. With that, luckily for you all, I did my bullet points in trilogies as well, so I'm done talking about myself. It's my honor now to welcome to the podium the author of Communicating Data with Tableau, the soul, the passion behind the wild success of Tableau Public for the last five or six years. Someone that's my personal mentor, my personal friend, Mr. Ben Jones. Okay. We're going to cover a lot of ground, so I'll make my introduction quick. I'm a technical evangelist out of Seattle, and what that means is there'll be an altar call a little later on. Um, as Kevin mentioned, I had a real privilege to run Tableau Public for five years, which allows people all around the world to tell just fascinating and creative data stories and the stories of our time, really, from a data angle point of view. And so that was a great pleasure for me. And uh, those are my two boys right there, Aaron and Simon. And we like to go hiking in the trails of Seattle. One funny thing is every time I upload a photo that has both me and Aaron in it, or even just Aaron, Facebook like auto tags, Aaron is me. <laughs> so he's the one in the middle with the glasses, as you can see. Um, and you already know about the book. So I actually also teach uh, like a continuation class at University of Washington, which is a data visualization theory. Those are three-hour lectures. So don't worry, I'm not going to give you a three-hour lecture. Instead, I'll just cover all that material in one hour, OK? <laughs> so beyond bars and lines, you know, uh, these are some things we're going to show you. We had a, you know, a, a heck of a time coming up with these. But we're really excited about these seven charts that, uh, and we'll talk about when we think they can be used. You know, bars and lines are great. Uh, many times, we're going to want to go outside of, of that for a specific reason. And we'll talk about why we think that is. Um, so Kevin will cover the ones on the left. I'll do the ones on the right, which means I win three to four. It's golf. The lower scores, the better, right? So um, one thing about bars and lines and going beyond it, well, uh, here's a quote by Edward Tufte. In information visualization, there are no rules, no guidelines, no standard technologies, no style books. You must simply do whatever it takes. I kind of see rules of thumb, but I, I get his point here, and I like it, that 
you know, we have to get our message across, right? And sometimes a bar chart will do it. Many times a bar chart will do it. We know that people are going to be able to um, really accurately decipher the proportions if we do that. But sometimes something else is needed. And so we'll talk about that and, and hopefully show you how to do it. OK, it goes fast, but uh, we're going to dive into it. So with that, I'm going to turn back over to my friend here, Kevin. He's going to talk about shape fills. OK, go, Ke go for it, Kevin. All right. And actually, I'm going to come back here to this quote just for a second here. I love this quote myself. And it's just talking about whatever it takes to tell that story, whatever it takes to draw your audience in and get their attention. Now, I talked about the pace we're going to go earlier. I like to call it the Ricky Bobby pace. And I'm going to go start to go fast. I've had a little too much coffee. Um, the reason we're going to do that is we want to get through as much content as possible. This is more about the art of the possible than trying to learn it today. It's not intended to be a hands-on session. So we encourage you to go ahead and close those laptops. You don't even have to take notes. We're going to give you a starting workbook, an ending workbook, all the step-by-step -step instructions. You're going to be able to look at the TC video. These are not charts you're going to use every day, so there's no need to memorize them. You can go ahead and put these in the tool bag, learn them at your own pace, pull them out as you need them. So with that, I'm going to get us started with shape fills. And shape fills on the difficulty scale are way down on the Wookiee end, so we're just getting warmed up here. Nothing more than a bar chart and a transparent image. This is all about goal attainment. Maybe you've seen that thermometer in the whiteboard in your office, like we're trying to raise a thousand bucks or whatever it might be. Um, of course, there's going to be a better chart for this, bullet charts. Bullet charts are really, really precise, but maybe they don't draw the attention like my two silhouettes here do. If you do use two silhouettes and one's a male and one's a female, you're comparing apples to oranges here because the shapes aren't the size. So this may be worse than two pie charts side by side. But with that, two pie charts may not draw you in as well. As we go through these, I'm going to point you to different places in the community. Ben's going to point you to some of his own tutorials, but we want you to be able to go learn more. Um, I learned these from people like Ken and Kevin Fleurledge. So they, they are twins as well, so keep them with that twins theme. Uh, Kevin wrote about this. He's new to the, newer to the community, whereas his brother uh, Ken is one of our Zen masters. And I was tickled to see that Ken and uh, Matt Chambers spoke at this conference on a similar type. They don't do the builds like we did, but it was really freaking awesome. It was called Beyond Show Me. Check that out on the video. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and jump into the build here. I'll get out of presentation mode, and this is where we're going to start to speed up. So the first thing I want to do is build a bar chart. I want to make it a little bit wider, and I want to change the axis here to be part in a whole. So I'm going to fix it at 100. Then I'm going to change the color to something that resonates. For me, I went to a baby sex reveal party recently. It was going to be a blue cupcake or a pink cupcake. So I'm going to choose pink here for the ladies. Once I've done that, I can go ahead and duplicate this sheet as a cross tab because I want to give it some precision. Um, since it's not going to be very precise, I'll give it a number across the top so I do have that precision. So I want to go ahead and format this so it pops off the page. So we'll make it a lot bigger. We'll make it bolder, and we'll make it pink. Then we're going to make the background black to help it pop. And then I'm going to come over here and get rid of my uh, column dividers and my row dividers. And I'd probably want to go ahead and get rid of the title. Since you all probably know how to create numbers and create bar charts, I won't do the gents. I've already gone ahead and done that. So there you see the gentleman's numbers with the light blue. I'm going to build a dashboard here. Um, let's make sure I'm untiled. OK, I'm good to go. So I'll bring in my gents percentage, and then I'll bring in my ladies percentage. Now, Beyond that, let's go ahead and bring in the numbers as well. I can just drop that right across the top and drop in my gents. And then we do some formatting here, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Now, another thing I want to do here is go ahead and bring in some blanks so I can control the size, the horizontal and the vertical. And I'll just drop that right across the bottom. So now I can take my charts and do like this. Now, the key is we're going to take a shape. Um, I've created a, let's use our image here, and change it to floating. So I've got my image that I've sh saved, not shaved, but saved. So I'm going to type in my girl here. And there's my image. So this was a black and white image. I took it into PowerPoint and just told it to make the white part transparent. Get a very high pixel PNG. That's going to be a trick. If you don't get something with a lot of pixels, this won't look very pretty. But you can see here how that pink, maybe you can or you can't, that pink is underneath. I would do the same thing for the male, but what I'm going to do now is fast forward. As we go through these builds, we don't want to bore you with the polish of removing lines, changing fonts, putting in the source of our data or anything like that. So we do the fast forward here. I'll put it into presentation mode. And now what we're looking at here is male versus female workers in a particular industry. I know that font is tiny. I don't want to make you squint. That says construction. So 91% male-dominated industry, probably not a big surprise. If I go to education and health services, it's 74.5. So this is dynamic. 
If I drop down into something like the financial activities, more of a 50-50 split. So I just wanted to get us warmed up with an easy one there, transparency and bar charts to create a shape fill. It's a fun one. Hopefully you can find some uses. With that, I'm going to flip it over here to Ben, and he is going to cover the dimension line plots. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, Kevin. Okay. He's fast. All right, so um, sometimes you know, a bar chart is great. It gives us the uh, real good perception of, of length, and um, you know, we can use that. It turns out that our, our visual cortex is very effective at taking a look at length and comparing two things like that. But sometimes I want to put an arrow in there. And, and you may say, well, that's a pretty standard Tableau shape. But I'm going to show you how you actually need a custom shape to make it look like this, where the arrow goes right to the end of a, the place where the, the bar ends or the line ends and it gives me an indication of, of stopping and starting. And then I also have a reference line there to show the end point. Dimension line part, plots, I think these are really good anytime I want to show change from one place to another. Or sometimes I may want to put arrows on both sides and give a sense of distance between two points. And that could be two points in time, it could be two groups, I want to highlight their difference or their gap. I did a little tutorial on this you can find on my website if you just Google data remix dimension line plots. Um, so. The reason why I came up with this idea is that uh, I went to school for mechanical engineering at UCLA back in the 90s, and we would do drawings like this for machinists to be able to you know, uh, help them kind of build uh, a mechanical part uh, to precision. And so I noticed that you know, the dimensions were very effective in, in the way we showed um, distances between two, in this case, edges. Uh, was, was really awesome, and I wanted to bring that effect to my visualization sometimes. So I'm going to do that now. Now, I took uh, the fun example of Back to the Future. I'm a child of the 80s, and I really liked that movie uh, series trilogy growing up with Marty McFly. But I wondered one time, I don't even remember why I wondered. It was maybe just a, you know how questions just come to you sometimes. I was like, how many times did the DeLorean travel through time in the, in the trilogy? You know the beginning when Marty gets in it and he zaps back to the 1950s where he meets his parents when they were before they started dating and then tries to get back. So, but over the course of all three of the trilogies, how many times did, they, did it, that little crazy car bounce around? And does anybody have a guess? 12? Higher or lower than 12? How many say higher than 12? How many say lower than 12? Okay, let's check it out. So I'm going to take this data set right here back to the future time machine. It's just that Excel spreadsheet. I think I pulled it off of Wikipedia, maybe. So I'm going to take each movie. Each movie has a name. I'll put it on rows. So oops, let me try again. Put it on rows right there. OK, and then I'm going to actually make this nice and big by changing it to, instead of standard, show the entire view. OK, there we go. And now every um, time jump right, is a, is a trip that the time machine took, and I have it actually measure for that that I've turned into a discrete uh, variable. So I'm going to take that trip and put it over here next to movie. And I don't want to sum them up. I actually just want to show them as their own individual dimensions. There we go. So you can see it's actually 13, so real close. Awesome. For those of you who said above, uh, you were right. And 12, that's pretty remarkable. Most people say like maybe six or seven. So there we go. There's every single one of them. Five times in the first one, you know, another six in the second one, and then a couple only in the third one. All right, so there we go. But you know, I, I don't want to just show uh, how many there are. I'd, I'd actually like to be able to show uh, how far the machine went back in time. So I have with me here departure day and arrival day. So I can take departure day and put it over here on columns. OK, there we go. And then so I'll turn this into a, instead of the, the, the year of departure, I like to know the exact date. Turns out these crazy movie aficionados have the exact date when it does that. And I'm going to turn this into a Gantt bar, OK, to try to build my lines to start. Right now, it's just a hash where, it, where he first, uh, where the, the time machine starts from, departure day, OK? And instead of putting the arrival date in there, as you all know, with a Gantt bar, you put the starting point, and then you use size to show the, this, the length of the, the bar on a Gantt bar chart, right? So I'm going to take the, the uh, time jump in days, here it is, and I'll put this on size. OK, wow, so I get to see, you know, here we go, 1980 is like right here, this like pivot line right here, kind of when the movie series came out. And I can see he, well, it's kind of hard to see what's going on, right? It's just, again, you know, why are we going beyond bars? Because the bar does tell me when the length of time, but I don't, I don't know much yet about what's happening. But I can put the direction onto color, and I can see that, you know, sometimes he goes back in time, sometimes he comes forward in time, 
hence Back to the Future. Um, but again, I still just, you know, I gotta kinda look back and forth with the color. It doesn't really give me that same effect as the arrows do. So I'm gonna do a, a dual axis. I'll take the size of these bars way down to make them just nice little thin lines, okay? And then I'm gonna take the arrival day. I want the arrival day to be, you know, for example, here he left, and this is, by the way, the first one is like a tiny little one. His dog, remember, travels like, man, I don't know, like two minutes into the future. So that's that poor dog going right there. Uh, so I want the arrow to go along here, da, 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 and I want the arrow to stop at the arrival date, right? So I'm gonna put the arrival day out there as a shape. So I'm gonna start by putting it up here on columns and changing from year to exact date again, okay? And I'm gonna change the arrival day well, first of all, I need to now make it you know, a dual axis because right now those charts are juxtaposed side by side, but I'd like to superimpose them. That's what dual axis does, as you all know. And you know what's uh, wrong about it as is is that it didn't synchronize, but I do want it to, so I'll right click and I'll synchronize, which means you know, 1980 lines up with 1980 on both views, just like that. Okay, great, but now what I'd like to do is, and on this one, by the way, on the arrival day, I don't really wanna size it based on anything yet. But um, I do want to turn it into, instead of a Gantt bar, I want arrival day to be its own shape, so I'll do that. And you can see that the default I have it set to here is, is the Tableau default arrow. This comes when you install Tableau, it's in your My Shapes repository. I'll make it nice and big just to make the point. And that is that you know, it doesn't end at the place you want it to end. It, it goes beyond it, because pretty much the center of the shape is um, in the center of the arrow. So it's like this, right? It's on, like on the one on the right, but I'd like to actually make it like the one on the left, where the center of the arrow ends in the middle. So all I did was make a couple little lines. I, I, like, dirty secret is I probably used PowerPoint for that to kind of make the arrow and the line. Okay, I did that, and so then what I can do is take the direction and put it on shape, and you can see what I've done. It's already defaulting to it, is I made in my, my, shape, my Tableau repository shapes folder, I added one called dimension line charts right here. There you can see all these different shapes I created and added to that folder. Okay, with all the arrows ending in the middle, both up, down, left, right, open arrow, closed arrow, it gives me the effect I want. And then last but not least, I will add arrival day as a uh, reference line. So I'll take my analytics pane reference line, drag it over here onto cell for the arrival day, put it there, and I get a nice little line showing the ending point. Cool. All right, so I've got my arrows, I gotta put them in there. There's my line plot. Okay, and then here's like the full dashboard. I put it in there and I added a little YouTube video right there where you can click on the line and it shows the video of the exact uh, clip from the movie when the car jumps back or forward, which I thought was kind of a fun addition along with a whole bunch of themes and such. And by the way, for that, what I did was, how did I get the video to play like that? You can't do it within desktop. You have to publish it, either to public or to, um, to, to you have to be looking at it from the browser. Let me make these a little bigger so you can see. You can see what the URL looks like here is I have a YouTube embed uh, URL, right? That, that's the same video all the way down. And then I can, you can see I started at second six and end at second 32. And the first one I wanted to have it not autoplay, so when you open the dashboard you have to click play. But all the other ones I want to set autoplay to one, meaning when I click the line, it just plays the clip and then the, the time machine's off and running, okay? So that's it for me for dimension line plots. I hope you like them. And now on to Kev for Lupe Maps. Thank you, Ben. I love that one. It takes me back to my high school days of architectural drafting. Oddly, I'm in a software company now, but AutoCAD ruined my architecture dreams. I like doing it with a pencil and a straight edge, so. Odd, odd stuff. So this next one's my favorite of my lineup by far. It's called a Lupe map. And Lupe, in case you didn't take French, and I did not take French, so if I'm butchering that word, please let me know. Lupe is the monocle a jeweler might look through to uh, take, check out the quality of a diamond or a precious stone. For va data visualization, we're actually going to use it to zoom in on a map with too many data points. Um, or not too many, but a whole lot of data points, and we don't want to lose the context. We could always zoom into a map, but then we'd lose the context of what it looked like as a whole. First time I ever saw this done, it was done by uh, Tableau legend, uh, one of our former employees, Alan Eldridge, who writes the last data, bend blender uh, data bender blog. That's a word, that's a mouthful. Um, he also wrote the white paper on designing efficient workbooks. If you don't have that one, please check that out. That makes my job easier when customers read that one. It's so informative. Beyond that, Evgenia uh, here, one of my colleagues, uh, helped me come up with that name, Lupe Map. so uh, I am not gonna take credit for that one. I'm not that creative. 
Um, but what we're going to do to do this is we're going to use that vis and a tool, fu tool tip functionality that we introduced in 10.5. We're going to use dual axes, and then I'm going to use a round um, function on my latitude and longitude to create some bins. So to show you this one, I'm actually going to use this map that Ben po uh, posted out on Tableau Public a few years ago that looks at New Orleans stop and frisk data. This does have a very social conversation around it, and I don't want to ignore that social conversation, but I want to take you through the build today instead. So we're going to look at New Orleans frisk, uh, stop and frisk data here. I'm going to chop out of the presentation mode. And to do this, I've got some data that came from, I believe from, was it from open, open data? Yep. Perfect. So we've got open data here. And there's some latitude and longitude data in here already, so I'm just going to double, double click these. And then I'll drag my, I've got my field interview ID, which is every single stop, so I see every one. Now I've already filtered for this, uh, for what we call Null Island. I'm going to pull that out so you can see where Null Island exists. It's out there off the coast of Africa. Um, I don't recommend it for vacations because there's not really an island there. Um, you'd have to bring a raft and a tent. Um, it's just where we don't have latitudes and longitudes. So we don't want that in there. I'm going to back that up. Now, the first thing we want to do is take the subject race and drop that into color here. And this is going to give us a map that's pretty difficult to read. We'll fix that in a minute when we come back. But for now, we're going to duplicate this. So that first one's going to be our viz for the tooltip. The second one, we're going to create a dual axis map. So to do this one, let's go ahead and fix the size. We're on the second map now, perfect. Fix that size so I can see all of my data points, over 60,000 in a very small space. So from here, what we want to do is create a dual axis. So I'll just drag my latitude out to the right, right click and do a dual axis. We're going to come down to that second measure and we're going to remove everything from the detail and the color. Now as I show you calculations today, I'm not going to build them on the fly, but I'll try to blow them up so you can see them and talk to them. So here's that uh, round function I talked about. We're just taking that latitude, rounding it to two decimal places. We're going to do the same for the longitude. And what that does is it actually creates at this latitude, it'll depend where you are in relation to the poles, that's about a half square mile. I believe there's something on Wikipedia about that technique. Um, so that's what I'm going to use here. So we've got that uh, lat bin and the long bin, and we're just going to bring them into detail. Um, and then we're going to create the viz and the tooltip off of that. So what we can do here is for that second measure, we're going to change it to a shape. Oh, where's shape here? Why do I not have shape? Thank you. Eight and a half years, I can't find shape. All right, so I've got shape in there now. Um, what we want to do is change the color to something that pops. It's going to be circles, but they're not big enough now. When I make them bigger, you can see they're everywhere. And what we want to do is just manually size this till they're Kind of touching, but not overlapping too much. Not a precise, uh, not an exact science here. But I like that there. Um, and we'll get rid of the opacity here so they kind of disappear. We're going to build the vision and tool tip off of that. But let's go back to that and add some more. Um, there's that shape down there. Add some more context. So I'm going to bring gender in here to shape. These are out of the box as well. We have a male shape, a female shape, and then an unknown. Um, that's not that, uh, well, I'll leave that one alone. All right. <laughs> Um, so from there, we just want to make the size a little bit bigger, too. I don't know where I was going with that one. And let me unlock this. So um, then when we come back over to our main map here, and we come to that second measure. And in the tooltip now, uh, we can go ahead and insert two fields now, or two sheets. Now, I didn't show it, but I created a title that just has a summary of the numbers. You'll see that pop up here. And then I'm going to insert, as well, that other sheet, which is the Lupe starter map. In here, there's something called all fields, and that works similar to an action. It's going to filter on everything as we hover. But we can actually change that here and insert that lat. And then we're going to insert the long bin as well. And we're going to do that for both. So I could do a control C here. If it doesn't work the first time, we'll just fast forward. Control, oh, almost got it. See, I missed one there. So we would drop that in there. And then as we hover over, what that's going to do, I'll put it in presentation mode to make it pop a little bit. Here, as I hover over this point, I'm zooming in, and in my vision of tooltip, I get a half square mile to see, OK, it was, there's the race breakdown, and I can look at the gender. Maybe I put a gender summary in there as well. Come down here by where the uh, conference center is, and it's just my first public service announcement, walk with a friend. There's a lot more stop and frisk going on down here, probably for a reason. Very, very crowded areas. Uh, maybe a little more crime. So with that, that's the Lupe map. I'm going to turn it back over to Ben now. Ben is going to take us through dimensional 
Marginal histograms, excuse me, dimensional histograms. Boom. All right. Last one's super useful if you really want to be stop and frisk, you know where to go. Okay, marginal histograms. So this is where we got a scatter plot. And actually, this is kind of a standard chart type for those of you who are familiar with R and some other st statistical packages where you can create, see along the top and the side right there? You can show these histograms that allow you to get a sense of the distribution in both axes. And I think it's really good for almost any scatter plot. It is a little tricky, and I didn't include it in the cautions there, but when the data is moving, as you're going to see with the way we make the technique, it's tough if the da data is dynamic. But for a static, single ad hoc scenario like this, I would almost always do it. And so I'll show you how to do it. I get a little tutorial like that. And it's a little tricky, but it's not bad. And again, it's kind of like with the, the Lupe's overlapping. It's not an exact science when we line it up, but you'll see we can get it pretty close. OK, cool. So it's about baseball data. And you know, I'm a Dodgers fan, so I'm a little nervous right about now. But this is a great quote from Lefty Gomez. Actually, I don't know if it's great. It's debatable. It's better to be lucky than good. Okay, and I think it's probably good to be both. He's like either or. Hey, I'd like to be both. But uh, speaking of that, uh, what if we take pitchers and pitchers in baseball? As you know, every time a pitcher pitches, either the team wins or they don't. They don't, right? Um, and so sometimes actually they get pulled out of the game when it's not determined, so they may not get a, a conclusion. But um, what you can get for every pitcher is uh, a win percentage. So I can see some pitchers up here with a really great win percentage, like Charlie Morton. This is from 2017. He won 83% of his games. Pretty good, right? You can go all the way down here. You can see some uh, pitchers, like James Shields, didn't do so well, 30.4%, right? Um, so he didn't win as many of his games. Uh, I think Kev's a, a Mets fan, right, Kev? No? OK, he's denying it. So there's a pitcher for the Mets, Jacob deGrom. He's kind of down here. I'm saying to myself, if I'm forming a team, all right, are you picking this pitcher down here? Would he, would he be in one of your first choices? Maybe not, right? I mean, this, this guy's not winning many of his games, 52%, you know? I don't know how great that is. I'd like to get one of these guys up here. But then a, th a thought occurred to me, well, hey, look, it's not always the, the pitcher's um, uh, fault if they lose, so to speak. So in other words, I can take a look at two things for every pitcher. I can take their ERA. That's a way of saying how many runs did they give up over the course of the game, over the course of a nine-inning game on average. How many runs would they let the other team score when they pitch? But you know, when the uh, team comes up to bat on the other side of the inning, in the American League, the pitcher does not even come to the bat at all. In the National League, they do, but they're only one out of nine. But in any, way, in any case, the team gets a certain number of runs. So the t uh, pitcher gets something called run support. And that means on the times, the days that they pitch, usually maybe one out of every five games, how many runs does their team score for them so that they can you know, win the game? Um, so there we go. Now we're going to take every single player, and we're going to put them on detail like this. Okay? And then we're going to add that win percentage, just like we had right there, win percentage, goes to color. And I'll switch it so that we can kind of get a little better effect here to, I think I was using like a blue and green, so I'll do that. Maybe, let's try this. Okay, so blue has really high win percentages and green has low win percentages, okay? So pitchers on the left, uh, all the way over here, are not letting up a lot of runs, right? But pitchers uh, on the right are letting up a lot of runs. Well, who do we know who this is? Let's take a look. If we go over to this version right here, where I kind of formatted it nicely for us, Take a look, that's Jacob deGrom. That's the New York Mets pitcher I talked to you about that only has ranked number 34 in wins, but he's number one in ERA. So actually, he is letting up the, le the least runs. It's just that his team's not getting a lot of runs for him. Poor guy. All right, so he is good, but unlucky. I put a little box right there. Good, but unlucky. There's some good and lucky. Yeah, that's the best of both worlds. People like Garrett Cole from the Houston Astros, you know, he's not letting up a lot of runs, and his team's just hitting out of the park when he pitches. And then you got these poor bad and unlucky. You know, that's just... It's like a double whammy. You're giving up a lot of runs and your team's not scoring. Okay, you guys get it. So I made this nice four blocker. But then again, I want to kind of put into a dashboard and put these histograms. Here's a histogram for ERA, right? This is Jacob deGrom over here. These are some of the worst pitchers. And then run support, I'm switching around on the axis like this. Here we go. So I've got my scatter plot. How do I put this in there? And let's go ahead and just for fun, let's make this all the way automatic so you can see in the back. There we go. I'm going to take the ERA histogram and use tiled. Bring it on up there. There we go. Okay, and I'm going to hide the title, and I'll drop it down in size. There we go. Nice and small. Cool. I got my histogram up there. I'm going to move the uh, put the run support histogram um, to the right of the graph because that is the y-axis. So there we go. It's there. Okay, and I'm going to turn off the title again, and, and uh, fit it to the whole view for now. Fit to the entire view. Same with this one. Let's fit this one to the entire view. 
Oh, it's already did that. Okay, cool. Now all I have to do is line them up. So this is the, the part that gets a little bit tricky, but I'm going to take blanks and do that. I'll put one blank next to this one. And I'm just using this little slider, you know, to kind of line up Jacob de Grom with this bar. So we're pretty much right above it. You know, again, it's not like perfect, but, um, but good enough. Good enough. That's my favorite two words, by the way. Good enough. Okay, so this goes over here. And that's just good enough. Good enough. Okay, there we go. Awesome. Same thing with some blanks over here with these guys. You guys get what I'm doing. I'm just going to take this right up there. Boom. Okay. And then another one over here. I've never whistled before while doing a demo. No. <laughs> Did it work? Or I don't know. Okay, that guy goes right there. Okay, awesome. Now, but it's like, well, it's just, it's cool. I can see it. And if I'm printing it out, I'm done. But if I want to let people interact with it, I'm going to go a step further and I'm going to create a dashboard action so that if anytime someone hovers over, they're going to get a highlighting effect. So what I want them to do is hover over any one of these charts, and it's going to highlight the corresponding marks in the other ones. And I'll actually hover, uh, I'd like to actually select it by bin, not by the player. I could do it by player, and that actually might not be a bad way to do it. And I'm going to try that, by the way. You can think about it and, and see which one you like better. But what this is going to let me do is, you know, when you hover over, right, you can see which, which bar gets highlighted there. I like that, OK? I can see all the players that are in this bar. If I want to see all the most common you know, run support play pitchers, I can see them. Who's the one with the least run support? Oh, that's over here, Cole Hamels, okay, you get it? And then what's also really awesome is I can hover over each one of these and see which bar they are on both sides, top and bottom, sweet. And then, you know, there's other ways to do this. I don't have to just use histograms. I'm just gonna show these to give you a sense, but one thing I also try to do is make it into a, a box and whisker plot. I thought that that was really awesome, the way that worked. So I used to get every one of them little dots here, so I can see, you know, for example, like this player right here, um, Rick Porcello of the Boston Red Sox is uh, just above the, uh, out of the box right here, right on both, and he's a, a pretty uh, far up outlier over here on run support. Okay, and I could even maybe do hash marks if I wanted to, if I wanted to keep it super simple. So those are different styles that are in the, the top and bottom. That's all I got on this one. I thought it was real fun, and I'm going to move on next to do sunbursts, okay? Go for it, Kev. <laughs> Amy. Yeah, so sadly on the plane, I realized that was 2015 data. Is there any baseball fans in here? Yeah, so it was even worse this year. He's gonna, I hope he's going to get the Cy Young, but that same Jacob deGrom, lower ERA, even lower run support. Incredible stuff. So this next one is probably most commonly referred to as a um, radial bar chart. It's essentially a bar chart wrapped around a circle. A bar chart wrapped around a line is a lot more uh, precise, if you will. But here I'm trying to shine the light on something. I'm going to use suicide awareness data or suicide rate data. I think the latter one sounds a little bit more morbid. But I'd seen a lot of, uh, a lot of news about some high-profile suicides in the United States in the last couple of years. And I thought we must be the leader in that. Or I guess that wouldn't be the leader, but the other way, right? The, I guess you'd want to have least. But I found out through my, uh, through my research there that we we're kind of middle of the road. We're a little above the average here in the United States, but there's some epidemics in other countries, and I'm going to try to point that out. I'm going to call it a sundial. If anybody saw me fumbling with my phone, I wasn't checking my messages. I'm not that rude. I'm actually going to make this sundial dial my phone here in a moment. Um, so, so a lot of folks don't know that that's in there, and it's probably the least Jedi thing I'm going to show you today. Um, so with that, this is going to get Jedi. We are going to go to Trigonometry 101. We're going to talk about pi, sines, and cosines, and we're going to create a uh, couple calculations for radial angle, radial length. So those bars that you see are line charts. It's actually a line chart. It's a path. It's all kinds of craziness. Um, it's all sitting on a scatter plot as well. So we have x and y. So that's a scatter plot, in case you were wondering. Now, the one thing that I haven't done in previous years with uh, Tableau, because we didn't have the product in this session, is use Tableau Prep. Uh, we need to create duplicate data set, and there's a real easy way to do that in prep now. So I'm going to show you that. So in case you want to read about this on the internet, I learned this from a guy named Dave Hart. He used to be with Innerworks. He created a really cool blog called It's Your Round at the Bar. Again, I'm not that creative. I thought that was a really neat name for it. But we'll get into the build. And I'm going to use some data here. And I, the source is on the final one. But I started out with World Health Organization and realized that the country with the ep epidemic isn't recognized by that organization. Um, so I wanted to use some different data. So we'll show that here. So to build this out, let me start with the calculations first. So coming to my suicide rate data here, um, this radial angle, let me pop that one, open it, and show it. 
So here, we've got an index minus 105. That 105 is completely arbitrary. You can put any number in there. You don't have to put any number in there. The blog uh, that I pointed you to has a parameter in there, so you can actually turn the dial. And that's all that's doing is pivoting it around that circle. Um, from there, we use a window count uh, of the count of the metric we're going to use, which is uh, the number of suicides per 100,000 people for all ages. We take that, we multiply that times two times the pi, because if you remember trigonometry, there's two radians, and that's just too much for 10.15 in the morning, or 10.45 in the morning. From there, we're going to create the radial length. The radial length uh, is a little bit simpler, I think. Um, but what happens there is you're starting from the center of a scatter plot. We want to go out 0.2, 360 degrees to start to form that inner circle. Again, an arbitrary number, you can put whatever you want in there and tweak that. From there, we're going to look at that path field that we're going to create. I'm going to show you that here in, uh, in prep in a second, but I'm going to create that path field. And if it's a zero, it's going to start at the center. If it's a one, we're going to figure out the length out to it. So let me show you that prep piece real quick. So in prep, I take my suicide data. It's going to take like 20 seconds. I used to do this in custom SQL or in Excel. So I bring in my suicide data twice. I bring it in. I union it to itself. I put on a clean step. I've got this new uh, field here called table names. That's the one I want to call path. So I've got my original set. That's going to be the zero. And the second set is going to be a one. I don't think it took the first one. We'll get that one in here in a second. Really doesn't matter. I've already put it in the data. Um, but we got it, I think. Well, the one didn't go, but you get the picture. It's going to be a zero and a one. We do the preview in desktop. Since I already have it in desktop, that mess up doesn't matter. Um, so here's that calculation. Now, to build the x and the y, this is where we're going to take the cosine times that radial angle, or the cosine of the radial angle times the radial length. For the y, it's the sine of the angle. So it's just too much trigonometry here, but you can copy and paste these once we give you the workbook. Um, so we've got it here. Now we're ready for the build. It's actually really easy. We change it to a line chart. I'm going to take that path and drag it into my mentions to make it discrete. And I can bring it right into my path field. That's why I called it path. From there, I just want to bring my country into the detail. And then I want to drop my x in and my y in. And I'm going to compute these both using the country. I want this at the country level. And when I do this one, all of a sudden the circle forms. I actually want to swap these axes. It doesn't matter. I wanted that x on top. But I get an oval. That's pretty close to a circle. The only reason is I've got a wider, I think I've got a wider x than a, than a y. I could fix those and make them equal. It would create a circle, or I can do it in the dashboard side. Two last steps I want to do here. I want to take my measure and drop it in color. Uh, we've got this nice red gold. I think it did really well for creating a sun. Um, so I put that red gold in there. And the last thing I want to do is drop, I've got a phone number in here for every suicide, or not every. If you live in a different country and you know the suicide hotline, I have this out on public. Please go out there and drop a comment in. It's actually one of the most com complete uh, lists of national hotline numbers if there was only one per country. So I only have one per country in here, and some countries have many. Think about India and how many languages and dialects are spoken there. So here, I've got that phone number in. It's in my tooltip. I'm going to fast forward to my finished product here, and I'll show you. How do I create that, um, that, that the, uh, telephone? Let me go ahead and put my ringer on. I was scared I would get a call during that. So I've put my ringer on, and now I'm going to go to my dashboard. I'll go to my actions, and I've created a URL action in here. And I'll just go ahead and edit that one and try to show you. It's really hard. I can't really explode this much. It doesn't do anything to make it bigger. Right in here, it says T-E-L colon. That is it. That's the Jedi trick, T-E-L colon. Mail to, if you have uh, email in there, you could drop that in there to email somebody. Talk about actionable analytics. Right here is going to call a hotline. And in this case, it's going to call my phone number because we're not going to mess with a hotline here. Um, so if I click in here and look for United States, the one in, uh, online has the right number. This one's actually going to dial mine. So I say, do you want to dial it? I hit yes. And I try to get that as small as possible so that you don't catch my home phone number. And then with that. <laughs> It takes a few rings for it to go on my phone because I've got Sprint. But there it is. That dashboard just dialed my phone. Oh. 
So I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that red bar that everybody's looking at right now going, what is the country, right? Greenland is the country. They're not recognized by the WHO. They're actually recognized as a territory. 8.82 out of 100,000 people means 1% of the, of the population commits suicide. It's an epidemic. I encourage you to go read about it. And I encourage you to know the signs of depression as well. It's my next public service announcement. If you have somebody who's struggling, please call one of these hotlines. They can be helped. With that, I'm going to turn it back over to Ben. He's going to do his last chart here, control charts. Thanks, Kev. It's great work. Um, for anybody who wants Kevin's phone number, when you watch the recording, you can just hit pause, OK, in the moment of showing. All right. <laughs> so uh, anybody do green belt training or black belt training? Remember Six Sigma? Yeah, I, I did that. I was really into it. I was a master black belt at his awesome medical device company called Medtronic and when I lived in LA we had diabetes products still do they still do but I left to join Tableau but I spent a lot of time with these charts and they look a little bit technical like it's almost like a what do they call those like a seismograph or something measuring an earthquake it's actually Tom Brady data you know we were kind of on the topic of um, average you know kind of mediocre teams so going with that theme <laughs> this is Tom Brady's stats sorry uh, so what are they good for? Well, they're good for checking time series data. Imagine I have a manufacturing line and I keep producing a, a part, okay, and then every time I make a part, I take a measurement to check my quality. Every one of those measurements goes on what we call an individual's chart on the top. Okay, that's the top line. The bottom uh, series is what we call the moving range chart. And all that shows is the delta between one point to the next, okay? So it's a moving range. How much did, it, uh, did I have this measurement? Okay, maybe I'm here. This is, this is Tom Brady's yards, actually, thrown in games. So in ga this game, he threw maybe 390 yards, okay? Then the next game, he threw 370 yards. So that's moving range delta of 20. It's negative 20, but you can see the bottom is zero. Actually, it's hard to see, but it's, it's actually, it's only the delta. It doesn't matter if it goes up or down. Because if then he goes from 370 back up to 390, it's still a delta of 20. So IMR, individual moving range chart. And what's awesome about it is those red lines on both, there's three of them, top and bottom above, and then one only has top, the top line. Those give you like your control limits. In other words, if a point goes beyond that, you know that there's a statistically significant signal in the data. And that's why these charts are really, really useful. Not just for manufacturing, which is where they're commonly used, but also transactional processes and measuring the performance of terrible quarterbacks. Okay, let's jump into this. He's an amazing quarterback, okay. Ah, uh, wow, right, actually, we're not gonna go that fast. We're gonna go right here to, here we go. Okay, so I am starting off with just a simple um, timeline. And what I've done is, you guys maybe know this trick already. I have a bunch of his stats here, you can see, right? His number of attempts, that's how many times he threw the ball. Average is how many yards he got on average during the course of a game, all right? How many interceptions he threw, hopefully a lot. How many times completion people caught the ball, um, the yards. There we go, remember yards, I was talking about that. I got all these stats for him. So I wanted to be able to switch quickly in the view. So this isn't the point of the tip, but it's just an extra. I made a parameter called statistic, and I put all these ones in here, right? Attempts, average, completion, and I, and I just put them in there as ways you can change this little guy up here, right? There we go. And then I made a calculated field called chosen stat. It doesn't matter what you name it. You can name it whatever you want. And then I said, you know, I put this little calculation in here, if then. This was a long time ago. Now I know to use a case statement, but either works. And this is saying if, the value of the parameter statistic equals attempts, then make this variable equal to the variable attempts, right? And then you go all, on, all in, on down the line. That's nice because then what I can do is really quickly switch the whole thing from yards to attempts to average, as you can see. But the control chart, which is the point of, of this entire uh, part of the demo, is to figure out if what, what my control limits are, right? So right now I have just the timeline for I, individuals. So I'm gonna add a moving range. Now to do that, I can take the chosen stat, and I'm going to use a table calc. I'm going to put it next to it. I don't want to see the chosen stat again. I already have it. What I want to see is the difference. So I'll click in the pill, go to quick table calc, and say um, difference. So now every one is a delta from one to the next, right? For example, you know, here he goes from this one to there, and so that's the value of the change. You guys get it, okay? But notice that it goes above and below zero, right? Because if he threw less, then the delta goes negative. But I don't want that. As I already mentioned, I want it just the, um, the positive, the, the value of the change itself. And we'll remember from 11th grade math, that's pretty much absolute value. So I'm going to go in here and say edit in shelf, this table calc, 
And I can just go ahead and put at the very beginning here, A, B, S, and put parentheses around this really crazy equation that I would have never figured out on my own that basically just means the delta. So I just put an absolute value there, as you can see. And now the whole thing changes so that everything's above zero. Cool. But actually, I'm going to take this off real quick because I already made one called moving range. So I actually get name it. There we go. So that's there. And I'm going to do another one real quick by putting it next to it. And so I'll get myself the uh, dual axis again here. Just like before, I'm going to synchronize these guys. This one on the bottom, I want to be a symbol, which is a little circle that kind of gives me this little. And then everything's too big, so I'll make the size just get a little smaller. I don't want to spend forever formatting, but I'll make everything a little smaller. That's great. Now, so I've got my individuals chart and my moving range chart, but I need to add the control limits. Control limits, a lot of ways to calculate them. A lot of people just do plus or minus three standard deviations. That's a pretty common way to do it. But I went to the school of this guy named Donald Wheeler. And what he wants you to do, you can look up his book sometime called Understanding Variation. And he lays out these calculations that I believe are from Walter Schuhart from the first part of the 20th century. But you basically take the chosen stat, OK? Then three times the average of the moving range, right? This average line down here. And you divide by this correction factor 1.128 that he pulled out of a hat, I think. No. <laughs> he proved it. <laughs> so there we go. That's my UCL. I'm gonna, see, I have that on detail already. You can imagine LCL, it's the same thing, just minus three times what's called sigma of x instead of um, standard deviation right there. See, minus. There it is. OK, so I've got them both there. So that means all I need to do is go to my analytics pane up here, take the reference line. Oops, there we go, reference line. Put it out there on chosen stat for the whole table. And I'll make the first one the upper control limit. Nice. There it is. Oh, cool. There it is, right? That's like, if he goes above this number, 473 yards, um, which I could probably do you know, on a decent day, then that, if it goes above that, then it would be out of control, statistically significant. I'll make another one of these ones right here on chosen stat and put this on the LCL, the lower control limit. They appear in this drop down here, guys, because I put them on detail. That's important to note. Now, if he goes below this amount, 20 yards, okay, that means he's having a bad day, statistically. That's pretty low. But I also want to put this range UCL. That's for this bottom chart right here. That equation, and I won't spend too much time on it, it's just 3.267 times the average of the moving range. So I take the average, and I multiply it by 3.267, and that's my statistical limit. It's not, it's not a limit anybody came up with and said it has to be more than this or less than this. It's determined by the data itself, which is really important to note. So I'll take range UCL, add it to my detail, OK, so that when I come over here to analytics and grab my reference line and put it down here on the moving range chart, OK, there we go. And I can see, yep, I want the range upper control limit. OK, there it is. Cool. So I noticed that even though everything's in control here, there was a, a day where his you know, delta was really high because he went from this really low game, see, to this really, really high game. It's this big, huge jump. You know, really bad day to a really, really good day, back-to-back -back games. So there's a big spike there. OK, so for now, for, I want to know signals, right? You can say, well, I can clearly see a signal. You're outside the control limit. You're below the control limit, right? But there's also other kinds of signals, like trends. If it goes up six times in a row, one gets bigger, gets bigger, gets bigger, then that's a statistical trend. There's, sh there's shifts if nine in a row are in, uh, below the average or above the average. We call that a shift. And so I just made some. Simple calculations that if anybody's taking notes, you can just jot this down real quick. OK, signals I, that's for the top one. Here it is. Pretty easy there. <laughs> I'll give you a minute. And actually, you know, let me know when you're ready. I'll scroll down. No. So what does it say? Oh my gosh, what is he doing? Well, I'm just saying, look, if the value, OK, right here, if that value is bigger than the upper control limit, then I'm going to call it an outlier. I'm just checking to see if it's bigger. If it's smaller, I'm also going to call it an outlier. So outliers for me are anything that are above or below the limit. That's the first check. Is it bigger? Yes, call it an outlier. No, go to the next one. Is it lower? Yes, call it an outlier. No, go to the next check. Now I'm just seeing, look at these in a row. Is it, did it get bigger from one to the next, then to the next, to the next? Did it keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger all that way six times in a row? Oh, then in that case, it's a trend. And same thing here. If it goes less and less and less and less, it's a decreasing trend. I'm still going to call it a trend. And then this last part right here is just for if nine in a row you know, are on one side of the average, greater than, greater than, that's a, a shift. Less than, less than, nine in a row, that's a shift. You guys get it. If none of those are true, boom, call it in range, which is what you're going to see for probably most of the data points. There we go. So I can take that, and I can put it on the symbols one for signals. I'll put it right there, color. 
And now you can see, sure enough, there's an outlier here, right? I knew that because I could see it. And that, what I didn't see by just looking at it is that there was a shift here. So that means these ones, not, that's the ninth in a row above the average line. Some of them just barely. OK, so that's a control chart. I love it. It's a great tool. Um, you know, what's kind of interesting is that one big day where he scored, you know, he threw for over 517 yards, I believe. I wanted to know why and see how it's big right there. Is it because he threw it for average? Was it really high? Nope, that wasn't really statistically significant. Did he maybe throw a lot of passes, attempts? No, he didn't really throw a lot of, of, of balls. Did, did just his receivers happen to catch a whole bunch? Uh, nope, that's not the case. Well, what is it then? Oh, it's long. Boom, there it is. He threw a 99-yard pass to Wes Welker, and you can see here it is right here. This is the play. This is the exact play. I'm not going to show it to you, but he's on the one-yard line. There he is. You don't see Wes Welker. He's in his pants right here, and he's going to throw a little pass to him. Wes Welker's going to break a tackle and run the whole way down the field, and that's why if it wasn't for that one pass, that one pass, he would have been pretty much having, you know, kind of a normal day. All right? That's control charts, and then we'll turn it back over here to okay. Kev. Awesome. So true story there. I learned, I learned those control charts reading Ben's blog many years ago, and I implemented them at NetApp in our uh, support center when I was there. So it doesn't have to be just processes. There's, we saw so many ups and downs, and the leaders were freaking, oh, we're up, oh, we're down, oh, no, stop, stop, stop. We can't freak out every single week about the numbers, right? Let's look and find the trends, what's really noise, what's not. I'm going to do the Sankey diagram. This one's backed by popular demand, and I'm going to get us out of here on time. Not a problem. We'll stick around afterwards if you, need, if you want to ask some questions um, or if you just want to chat. So Sankey diagrams, dead sexy. Uh, that's what they're all about. People love these things. They're, they got their curves. Uh, they're good-looking charts, but they're also good for something. They're good for process flows, workflows, people flows. If anybody's seen uh, Menard's uh, visualization, uh, what was it, the Napoleon's March? Napoleon's March on Russia, um, that, is a, that is in itself a, it is a flow chart similar to a Sangi diamond. It doesn't look like this, though. Um, to build these out, the middle is pretty complicated. It takes some pretty hairy calculations for padding, for T-scores, for um, the curve, for the sigmoid, right? Lots of neat, neat terms there. I'll show you those calculations. And again, we do a duplicate data set here. On this one, I'm not going to show it, but I do it in prep same way. And I'm going to create the column called which data, real or dummy. Am I using the real data or am I using the dummy data? And that's going to be able to replicate the data across. Now, Chris Love from the Information Lab, I believe he's another Zen master. Uh, if not, he probably will be. Uh, this is where I learned 99% of this technique from. I'm not taking any of the credit. I stole his numbers and everything, and he gave me credit now, or he gave me the ability, or he allowed me to use it. I was warming up doing a dry run on uh, Monday morning, and uh, there was two guys sitting in the room, and I get to this slide, and he goes, oh, that's me. So, oh, this is not going to, I didn't, hadn't met him in person yet, so that was pretty, uh, pretty daunting sitting there doing it in front of him. Um, so with this one, I'm going to look at UN migration data. I'm looking at uh, immigration from this area of the world to that area of the world. So I'm going to use this UN migration data. To get us started, let me show you the pad for bins calculation. It's nothing more than that data, that field we created. If it's the which data field, we're going to give it real. If it's not, we're going to give it, uh, or if it's dummy, we're going to give it a 49. And so what we do there is then we create bins of one. So if I can find the edit on this, where are we? Help me out. Oh, I thought I could see that one. Anyway, um, oh, I've got the wrong one. All right, pad, we'll drop it in here. It's just pads. It's bins equal to one. I'm not sure why I couldn't see it there. But you see I only have one in 49. That's because I only had two values. Well, I'm going to fill in the missing values one at a time with that padding is what I do, one through 49. Once I've done that, I'm just going to make this a line chart, take that padded, and drop it into path. Next calculation I want to show you here is the T calculation. This one you can just find off the internet. It's common calculation, index minus 25 divided by 4. I take that T, I'm going to bring it into columns here, and then I'm just going to make sure I compute that using the padded. That's a common theme. I get negative 6 through 6. That's where I want to be right now. Next thing I want to do here is show you the rest of the calculation. So I've got rank 1 and rank 2. They are identical. Running sum of the immigrant volume divided by the total sum. I'm going to use that in a nested calculation. That's why I have two calculations named the exact same thing, because I want to set the sort order on the left and the sort order on the right of those curvy lines. 
So with that, that's my rank one, my rank two. Those come into this calculation called curve, where I take that, you uh, don't need to walk through that one, it's just some pluses and some minuses times the sigmoid, and the sigmoid, again, common calculation here, one times the exponent and the power to the negative one or the negative t, again, you're gonna be able to come and copy and paste those. The last calculation is really easy to uh, consume, if you will, it's the running average of the sum of the immigrant volume, which makes those curvy lines stay the same size as they go across. The running average of the sum will do that. So we're ready to build the rest of this thing out, and it goes kind of fast. So I'm going to take the origin, col origin area and drop it into color. So each line is going to represent where they came from, or the color will. Take the destination, and I'm going to drop that into detail. Take the curve, and I'm going to bring this into rows here. And then this is, a, this is a table calculation, is a nested table calculation. So here I have rank one, rank two, and T. I need to set these to a specific order. So I've got dimension, origin, and area. I can actually move these around. So origin comes first. So I wanna, this is, I'm sorting it on the left side. And then the rank two is gonna sort it on the right side. Destination, origin, padded. And then T is just gonna be padded. So it starts to look like a Sankey here, except it's got those ugly hockey sticks on the end. And I want to reverse this, so I'm going to edit this axis, just reverse this real quick, and then come to my x-axis, and I'm going to trim the edges off by fixing it. So I fix it at negative 5 and 5, and this could be different for your data. So I'm going to hit negative 5 and 5. The last thing I need to do is bring that size calculation into the size uh, shelf, that's why I named it that. I need to compute that as well using padded. And then once I've got that, I can make that size nice and big. So we've got the center of our Sankey diagram just like that. From there, we need to build the pillars on the outside. Luckily, that is nothing more than a stacked bar chart. So I take my immigrant volume, I'll take my origin area, drop it into color, use my control. I can drag that immigrant into the label and then simply put a quick table calculation so I get the percent of total. To create the right side, I'm just going to duplicate this and I'm gonna bring the destination area into color, and that's done. The only thing I didn't remember to do here is on the size, it makes it really neat if you just max out that size, that's gonna let the centerpiece flow right into your chart. So when I create the dashboard now, I take that outer, the left side, I take the right side, I'm gonna put a blank in between, and then I'm gonna take my centerpiece, my Sankey starter, and actually I wanna float this guy. So I'll take the Sankey starter, and I'm gonna drop it in like such. And you should see it flow right in on the right side. Now obviously, this, I've gotta get rid of a lot of headers, I've gotta get a little rid of my axes, get rid of these lines in between, line it up perfectly, but that's it for the Sankey. Once you get those calculations, it's actually a relatively easy build. So I wanna show you really quick, hold that applause, I appreciate it, but um, there is a neat story in here, I promise you some vacation information later, right? Um, so that is what we're looking at there is a place called Oceania. So if you're not familiar with Oceania, maybe you've heard of Polynesia, Micronesia, little beautiful islands and tropical areas, right? Less than 1% of the world's movement leaves that area. Oh, if I could get that little tiny slice, see those little lines? Those are the people that leave Oceania, yet nearly 10% of the world's movement goes there. So I think of that as Hotel California. You can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. So. With that, that is, uh, that is the last build we're going to do. I'm going to jump out. So as I mentioned earlier, the resources will be out on TC Live for this year's stuff, but you can also get on YouTube and check out last year and the year before. Those are still living there uh, in eternity, if you will. With that, be sure to fill out those session surveys for all the sessions. We want the information back so we know what to bring you next year. Thanks so much for choosing us over people like Georgia Lupi, who was presenting at the same time. We had to miss her. Uh, but thank you so much for choosing ours.